In today's video, we're going to talk about expert testimony in a family case, so a custody case or a divorce case. The most common expert uh, witnesses in these types of cases uh, are when it comes to finances, you've got experts testif testifying to the value of real estate, experts testifying to the value of a pension or a business, you know, assets that assets where the value um, isn't as clear as just looking at a bank account statement. Um, or in custody cases, you'll oft, often have an individual conduct a psychological evaluation and testify as an expert at trial as to what custody arrangement is in the best interest of the child. So I'm going to show you the statutes and practice book sections that kind of regulate expert testimony. Uh, so to do that, I'm going to share my screen here. So Code of Evidence uh, Section 7.2 talks about testimony of experts. So it says that a witness qualifies qualified as an expert by knowledge, skill, experience, training, education, or otherwise may testify in the form of, of an opinion or otherwise, or otherwise concerning scientific, technical, or other specified knowledge. If the testimony will assist the trier of fact in understanding the evidence or in determining a fact in issue. So basically an expert is testifying as to an opinion. A normal witness won't testify as to an opinion. They're just kind of presenting facts on what they observed or what they heard, things like that. But an expert is coming in and testifying as to their opinion as to, you know, in the examples I gave before, their opinion as to the value of a business or their opinion as to what custody arrangement is best for a child in a custody case. So 7.2 um, is kind of the basic uh, code of evidence section that talks about testimony of experts. And then 7.4 um, gets into a little bit more detail. So it says an expert may testify in the form of an opinion and give reasons therefore provided sufficient facts are shown as the foundation for the expert's opinion. So they have to give a foundation for how they came to their opinion. Um, and it says the facts in the particular case upon which an expert bases an opinion may be those perceived by or made known to the expert at or before the proceeding. So generally it's gonna be before the proceeding. So, you know, an expert, if they are doing a real estate appraisal, they will have gone into the house and looked at, you know, the size of the house, the condition of the house, the market conditions in the neighborhood, um, you know, to, to basically give, you know, they have to present the facts as to how they came up with their opinion. Um, so those are kind of the code, code of evidence sections. And then the practice book section uh, 13.4 gets into a little bit more specific practical detail about it. So 13.4 says a party shall disclose, <coughs> a party shall disclose each person who may be called by that party to testify as an expert witness at trial and all documents that may be offered in evidence in lieu of such expert testimony in accordance with this section. The requirements of section 13.5 shall, you can kind of disregard that, or it's not super important that 13.5 is just has to do with uh, an ongoing duty to disclose. So as, as an expert, you know, gathers, you know, if you do an expert disclosure on, you know, in August, you have an ongoing duty to disclose documents that are kind of the basis for the expert's testimony. And then a party shall file with the court and serve upon counsel, so opposing counsel, a disclosure of expert witness, which identifies the name, address, and employer of each person who may be called by that party to testify as an expert witness at trial, whether through live testimony or by deposition. In addition, in addition the disclosure shall include the following information. And we'll get into that in a second, but I've got I've put together a sample disclosure of expert witness. So again, it uh, what it just said was that you have to put the name and employer and address. So that and that stuff is right here. 
uh, pardon my cheesy names here. I'm reading a Sherlock's home book, Sherlock Holmes book right now. So uh, that was the easiest name to put in there. And then it says the disclosure shall include the following information, except as provided in subdivision two. All right. So it basically says you have to provide the field of expertise and the subject matter on which the witness is expect, expected to offer expert testimony, the expert opinions to which the witness is expected to testify, the substance of the grounds for each such expert opinion, and the written report of the expert witness, if any. Now you don't have to file the actual report with the court. Um, you you know you'll provide the you know in a psychological evaluation there will be a written report or in a you know with a somebody testifying as to the value of real estate they will have a written appraisal. So you don't file that. You just provide it to all the parties to the case, and then disclosure of the information required under this section subsection may be made by making reference in the disclosure to the written report of the expert witness containing such information. So, for example, in a, um, you know, in a psychological evaluation, you don't have to put all the, you know, you don't have to put all the substance of the psychological evaluation into your expert disclosure. You can just make reference to the expert you know, the psych, the written psychological evaluation report in general. And I'll show you a sample in a minute. Um, so here is a sample. This is using a psychological evaluation as an example. So again, we put the kind of background information there. And then we've got the subject matter on which the expert is expected to testify. So Dr. John Watson is the court appointed custody evaluator uh he issued his child custody evaluation report on august whatever you know enter the date and so that's kind of what we talked about before where you make you can make reference to uh the disclosure where you can make reference to the written report I was on to say in accordance with the you know the evaluation dr watson will opine as to which custody arrangements are in the best interest of the party's minor child Specifically, he will testify that in his expert opinion, the plaintiff should have sole legal custody of the minor child and the defendant should have no more than two hours of supervised visitation with the minor child. So you've, you know, you've got to put the kind of what the expert's going to ultimately testify, or again, you can make reference to the report. Um, Dr. Watson is expected to testify as to the psychological and intelligence testing employed during the psychological evaluation. Furthermore, he will testify as to the mental health of the parties and the party's minor child. He will testify as to the psychological needs of the parties and the party's child and whether he recommends therapy for the parties or the minor child. Um, so basically that's all that he's going to testify to of you know what his opinions are um what his recommendations are going to be and then you have to put the substance of facts and opinions uh the substance of the facts and opinions and the grounds for the opinion so dr dr watson will testify based upon his education and experience including his experience conducting psychological evaluations he will further testify based upon his psychological testing of the parties and his interactions with the parties and the party's minor child. He will further base his testimony upon his contact with third parties, including the guardian ad litem and the documents Dr. Watson received from the parties and the guardian ad litem. So basically, you've just got to identify you know, who the expert is, um, what they're going to be testifying to you know what their opinion is going to be that they're going to testify and the grounds for you know how they came to that conclusion and their you know their kind of experience and you know background so let's talk about you know the actual testimony so obviously you have to file the expert disclosure in advance and uh section 13 dash 4 the 
practice book section we just reviewed gives some more information on the timing of when when all the documents should be submitted. So you're going to want to review that in a little bit more detail. Um, but from a practical standpoint, after the expert disclosure is filed, obviously you then do the actual testimony. So when you're in court and if you're calling an expert, you're going to call them to the stand and you're first going to ask them you know, their name and occupation, who they are and what they do. Then you're going to take them through um, you know, a series of questions. You're going to first want to talk about their, their background in more detail. So their education, their training, their experience, um, any licenses they have, certifications, et cetera, any publications that have been pub that they've published. Um, all of that that kind of builds up their credibility to the court. Um, you know, if your witness has testified as an expert before, you're, you'd want to bring up, you know, ask them if they've ever, you know, how many times they've testified in as, as an expert. Obviously, if they've never testified in it as an expert, you probably don't want to ask that question because it's not going to add a whole lot of cred credibility. Um, and then, you know, so you'll go through kind of those questions to qualify the expert and establish their credibility. And then you're just going to ask the court that the witness be admitted as an expert. And then once you ask that the court that the witness be admitted as an expert, the opposing counsel will either um, you know, agree to them being admitted as an expert or they they will object. And if they're gonna object, then they have their own opportunity for voir dire. So they'll basically be able to ask um, the expert a series of questions to kind of cut down their credibility. Say, you know, oh, you've only been doing this for two years or six months, or, or oh, you've only conducted one psychological evaluation before. This is your first psychological evaluation or you've never published anything related to this. And you primarily specialize in, you know, adult therapy and you really don't work with children. You know, they may ask questions like that to cut down the credibility of the expert. And then ultimately the court's either going to allow the expert in or they're going to object. Um, and then after that, you're just going to get into asking questions about kind of the, you know, the subject matter of what the expert is there to testify to. So, you know, you'll go through, you know, their observations, the facts that they're basing their ultimate opinion on, and then they'll, you know, kind of state their findings in their report of what they, you know, what they, you know, it's basically them testifying to what they are, what their opinion is and the basis for it. So, you know, whether, again, whether it's an appraisal, you know, something related to finances or a recommendation, having to do with custody or, or anything else. Um, so those are kind of the basics on how you present expert testimony in court.